How could Lola the urchin be the head of a complex modern nation? How could the semi-urchin Adolf Hitler rise to the leadership of the best schooled country on record? How could Thomas Edison drop out of elementary school before he was 12, leave home, go west with no money or no contact during the Civil War years, and by age 15, have four solid streams of revenue and a write-up in the London Times? How could this penniless dropout invent the electric light, the phonograph, win 1,003 patents, and create the mighty corporation that was to become General Electric? By the way, he set up an entry examination for jobs, and he said no college graduate ever passed the test. <laughs> How could any of these things be true if what you've been taught was even remotely correct? Why has no school, no politician, no foundation, no public institution ever connected the dots for you as I just did? Was that in your best interests? In the year 2006, the University of Connecticut wanted to discover how much learning occurred between entering college as a freshman and graduating as a senior. They selected five academic areas for study and they picked 50 colleges to measure. A total of 14,000 undergraduates were randomly selected to participate. Nobody on this planet could have anticipated the result. In 16 of the 50 colleges, which included Yale, Brown, and Georgetown, the graduating seniors knew less than the incoming freshmen. <laughs> In the other 34, there was no measurable growth evident, although up to a quarter of a million dollars had been invested in an average of six years of time. After all the exaggerations, college for many is still just school. On April the 13th, 2008, the television show 60 Minutes reported that a cancer patient, John Kansias, had developed a heretofore unknown method of attacking tumors, which Nobel Prize winning cancer researcher Rick Smalley said, quote, would change medicine forever, adding that in 20 years of cancer research, it was the most impressive development he had ever seen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Kansas method destroys tumors without chemotherapy, surgery, or the familiar kind of radiation. What impressed the 60-minute producers was that Kansas had no college degree and no background in science or medicine, but as a boy, he had been obsessively an amateur radio buff, building shortwave units. He knew as one of the many odd facts that hobbyists accumulate that radio waves passed through metal will heat the metal up to a high temperature. Now in late middle age, contemplating his own death, he wondered if his tumors could be injected with metal, bombarded with radio waves, and the cancer would be killed by the ensuing heat. Kansas tested his theory in his garage on a raw hot dog. That was his equipment. <laughs> Using a machine he constructed out of used pie tins. 
when the bottom of the wiener was injected with metal and shot through with radio waves, it cooked while the top of the dog remained cool. Preliminary work in university laboratories where he took his finding seemed to show that indeed radio waves do kill cancer when the tumor is filled with nanoparticles of metal, something the vast specialized educated empire of cancer care never managed to stumble upon in its many decades of existence. It took a non-scientist without a college degree, motivated by 36 rounds of chemotherapy, which left him so sick he couldn't sleep to uncover this connection. The assessment tools pedagogy has devised, and for you libertarians, I hope you know what the word pedagogy derives from. It, pedagogy also exists, pedagogus in Latin. It's a class of slave who takes orders from the master and imposes drills and discipline on the end. doesn't create anything, but simply transmits the orders of the master. So what we've, what we've allowed to transmit through 23 centuries to uh, a modern America is a term for the profession that's a profession of slaves and pedagogy would be the science of preparing these slaves for their function. I don't think that that transmission is either an accident or insignificant. The young people we can find in schools today once cleared this continent when it was still wild. They whipped the greatest military power on earth. Most of the revolutionary army, including its officer corps, were teenagers. The Marquis de Lafayette was 17. Alexander Hamilton, a colonel, was 19. George Washington was the old man of the revolution at 42. They whipped the greatest military power on earth, not once but twice, drove out the French and Spanish, invented novel technologies, built roads, canals, cities, sold ice, to faraway India and spread open source creativity over every aspect of American culture. A major reason they were able to produce so many miracles from the six shooter to the steamboat to manned flight was they weren't weakened by the phony concept of adolescence for which there's not a scrap of scientific evidence or by any artificial extension of childhood through forced schooling. Early American society celebrated accomplishment as any frontier society must before the politicians and the schemers collude to build managerial sinecures for themselves. The economy prior to the Civil War was dominated by independent livelihoods. As Abraham Lincoln told the Wisconsin Agricultural Association in 1859, it had room for anyone of energy and ideas, whether they lived in a mudsill shack or behind brass knocker doors. Foreign visitors were dazzled by the energy released by a society so revolutionarily egalitarian, one which mixed all ages together, learning from one another. The Civil War changed everything. In the northern industrial state, which emerged in its wake, entrepreneurialism was unwelcome. Factories and finance came to rule the roost, and with that transformation, people with minds of their own became troublesome to management. 
lives assigned to follow orders are from a man.